Hi everyone. Um, my talk today was going to be about the building on top of the WordPress Visual Customizer. Um, it was going to tie into a product that we're busy building, but that's not ready. So I'm going to talk about something else which I'm passionate about, and that is uh, people who call themselves UX designers when all they do is work in Photoshop. Um, this is something that I'm thinking about for a while, and uh, I was recently at a WordCamp in New York, and there was a design track, and almost everyone on that design track uh, called themselves a UX designer, and I made a point of asking, you know, have you guys ever done anything with regards to user experience besides Photoshop? For example, have you ever tested, have you ever watched someone use your, your product, which isn't your girlfriend or your boyfriend? And the answer is no. So uh, it really got my juices flowing, and I got a bit frustrated because I traveled all the way to New York to hear about user experience and no one had anything. Everyone spoke about icon fonts. So generally, uh, this is what you get a lot of the time. This is a lot of bull and he's a UX and UI designer. Uh, no problem. <laughs> There's a switch on the side, the icon. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> so anyway, when you uh, log on to Dribble and you see all these like beautiful little, has anyone ever visited Dribble? It's this website which curates like really great de um, designs and uh, th pretty much anyone on Dribble lists themselves as a UX and a UI designer. Um, but all they've ever done is posted some Dribbles and gotten 10,000 likes. Um, most people actually are UI designers. The, the people who design for the internet um, use Photoshop, Fireworks, Sketch, and they create interfaces, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're creating experiences. But most of the time, the experiences that they're creating are bad ones, no matter how good it looks. Um, so we're going to focus on that UX part. The UI part, you know, cool. I mean, I used to design, when I first started designing, I was using Microsoft Paint. No jokes. And uh, I would create things and then export them as little GIFs and JPEGs, or bitmaps at the time. That was a, quite a while ago. Okay, so what is UX design? Well, it's not just pushing pixels around in your Photoshop in, uh, application. It's not just, you know, creating something which looks beautiful. It's something which can maybe, you know, it works. And people who interact with it, uh, it almost feels second nature to them. Like, that is really good. That is good UX design. Sometimes it has nothing to do with designing on your laptop. Sometimes a, user, a good user experience design is something that talks in your ear. For, for example, that Motorola sort of ear thing that they've created, and you never actually interact with anything except, you know, speaking. That is good user experience design. And uh, a lot of people these days, because they're pushing the pixels and because they've created this interface, they are now experienced designers. And it's so much more than that. There's, it's no longer possible to be that one person which creates a, an experience. There's, many moving parts. It's more than pushing pixels. And first of all, it's a collaborative effort. There's many people involved now in creating a really beautiful user experience. There's, first and foremost, there's research. It's finding out your marketplace and the type of people are going to be using your product. Not just your mom, not just your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Um, it's, you know, what age group, uh, sort of what level of uh, education and where are they going to be using this product? Those things are very important. Once you gather that information, you can analyze it and determine whether you, know, whether you will be using a web interface, a phone interface, or just a voice interface. Uh, there's also the content, the type of words that you use, and like whether you should be using a lot of words or just one button. Those things are very important. And finally, once you've gathered all that information, you can start placing it. If you've decided that you want to design a web interface, you can take all that research, that analysis, the content, and place it on a screen, start pushing pixels around. But at that point, even then, you still haven't created something which just looks pretty. It's just something which is usable. Uh, but leading up to that point, there's so many steps that UX designers skip along the way because they think that you know, they've read something on like Google or they've asked Twitter about certain UX standards, and now that they're UX designers, they can create these beautiful interfaces. Finally, the most important part, which I feel strongly about, is the testing element. So you may have done all this research and analysis, and everything that, has come back to, that you've come back with has confirmed what you believe to be true, and you know, confirmed the things that you read on Google. 
And then you push the product out into the market and it turns out that everyone hates it and you don't know why. Um, and that's because you didn't do any testing up to that point to validate the thoughts. So testing and validation is absolutely critical. It's Sometimes you'll test something, you'll have to start the whole research and analysis and content creation. You'll have to start that loop over again. But if you don't do that testing, you'll never know. So as you gain more experience in user experience design, you will uh, realize how quickly you need to iterate on those little, on, on research, on analysis and things like that. But testing is easy, says a lot of bull. Um, it's just a matter of showing my friend or uh, my girlfriend or, you know, the guy sits next to me at work, just showing him the interface I've created and pointing him around and seeing what he says. But it has nothing to do with that. Um, testing a fairly professional or reading the internet is the last thing that you should do when you think about user testing. Um, when you test your fellow professional, the, the most likely outcome you're going to get is an opinion. And what, you, what you're trying to do is not search for an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. And the more experienced your friend is that you're showing this to, the more likely is that he's going to give you an opinion that is opposed to what you're showing him. And the thing about those opinions is it's not it may be based on his experiences, but it's not based on the research and analysis that you've done. So when you do that user testing, it's important that the people that you're going to show this product to are in the target market that you've done research on. And uh, also, asking you a better half is not going to work because when they give you your op their opinion and it's opposed to yours, you may find yourself getting offended. And I can promise you now, I've been there. It gets. <laughs> It's pretty disheartening. I've, seen, I've even seen my brother sometimes. He's like, oh, bro, I showed a friend and she didn't like this thing at all. Eh? He's like sweating. I'm like, well, you shouldn't have done that in the first place. Finally, asking Twitter is the worst of all of them because they have no context. So if you show them a screenshot where things are moving around, you know, they may just call you a dribbler or something like that. It's not going to work. So here's a quick how-to on how to do proper user testing. You know, Sure, you can hire a professional, which I'll get into later, but if you don't have you know, 100,000 Rand or plus to spend on user testing with professionals, then how do you do it yourself? How do you, you know, do it on the cheap, like we tend to do? So first of all, define your market. When you're creating a product that people are going to interact with, you need to make sure that you know who those people are. So it's no point... Sure, you've got to create something, you know, a lot of times when people say, oh, I really want to create a startup, da, 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 people say, solve your own problems. That's okay, but if you're only solving, if the problem you're solving is just for you in the whole world, well, you know, maybe it's not worth launching that product. You need to know the market that you're building this product for. You need to know, like, like I said earlier, the demographic that they sit in. And once you understand that and you've designed an interface for them, you need to go out and find them and try and bring them in to do testing. And you'll find more often than not than they're actually in your own town. You know, the, the amount, sometimes when we test, we, it's just a matter of finding five people and they're down the road or they're 30 minutes away and we pay them like 200 Rand to come in for two hours and push, uh, play with our interfaces. When these people come in and you want to test them out and you want to test your interface out, it's important that you give them space to work. You can't sit over the shoulder and say, oh, click here, oh no, don't click there, oh, that thing's not kind of working. The interface that you give them to test, it needs to allow them to flow through the process and break things on their own without them getting to a dead end. If something does break and they get confused, don't tell them where to click. Ask them rather how they think they'd get out of that. And while they're doing this, make notes of, the solutions that they come up with because often, more often than not, um, you may actually use those solutions in your final design which go against general conventions which you read about on the internet. Record as much as you can. Uh, use, phone, use your phone, your iPhone to film them. That's usually the best method and a pen and paper work best. Um, often Mark and I do user testing. We make notes upon notes upon notes just with a pen and paper. Nothing too smart. Uh, we don't use any sort of uh, recording apps on the screen. We just sit there with an iPhone behind them. We ask them to do their thing, tell them to be, you know, just that. Click where you think you should go. Like, at the end of the day, you just give them one task. When we tested our checkout process, we said, 
here's our credit card. Visit our site, oboxthemes.com, and buy a theme. We didn't tell them which theme to buy. We didn't tell them which pages to click on. We just said, buy a theme. And the things we learned along the way were incredible. We made close to a thousand notes in that. Uh, you know, it, the things that you, re you don't realize how even educated like web users interact with your, with your site. It can be, for us, for example, we learned that screenshots were more important than the copy we used. They'd literally look at a screenshot of like a dodgy demo that we put together and they'd like see like the, the menu. It would be like, oh, so I can have a home page, an about page, a gallery page. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I slapped that thing together like last minute, took screenshots just so the page looked good and the flow looked good. And here they are determining whether they buy one of our things based on a, that little shitty screenshot. So, you know, those type of things you'll never know about until you sit there and you witness a, a genuine end user or customer interacting with your designs. If you do have budget, then you should consider hiring a professional. Um, we used some guys in Cape Town called Flow, uh, and they did incredible research for weeks before even beginning the test. They had the time and obviously the budget to dedicate to doing a proper UX experience where it wasn't just one person making guesses or it wasn't just my brother and I like rushing to test something. While we were developing products in the background, they were preparing a, a proper thorough user test where we sat um, behind one-way glass and watched our, our users, our customers, interacting with the designs via a TV screen. And again, we just made as many notes as we could. And yeah, what came out the other end was we doubled our conversion rates, I think, or it was close to double of the, uh, our conversion rates. And we realized our payment provider to checkout was actually, they had a huge amount of um, user experience issues on their side, which they'd never tested before. So we bundled our whole video and everything and sent it to them, and the return on our investment was you know, tenfold on that 100,000 Rand that we spent testing with professionals. And there you go, that's it. Nice quick talk, because I probably need to get to an airport, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave, for your, uh, for your talk. Quick and easy. Yes. Uh, anyone, if you, oh, right here at the front, so superseded me there. Hi, Dave. Um, you talk about getting people in and filming them and so on. I know there's a few apps out there that record screen hot, hot spots and so on. Have you tried them? Recommend any? Yes, uh, Inspectlet. It's a little piece of uh, JavaScript that we install in the foot of our website and it records every single person that hits our website. It attracts their mouse. And uh, we can watch them, we can watch them type a contact message, but before they type that contact message, we can see how they got there in the first place. So it really helps with uh, optimizing uh, checkout flows and brochure pages. Inspected. Yeah, inspect it. Great, thank you. Anyone else right at the back? I'm gonna get some exercise for a change. Where was the hand you say? Thanks very much, no problem. Um, hey man, um, user-centered design sounds like a time-consuming and expensive process. Can you share the insights um, you found that returned, uh, that gave you the most return on investment? And then also um, your most obvious learning out of the uh, UX process. Our most uh, obvious thing was the screenshot element and the, you know, the important that, importance that our customers place on those screenshots. Um, ever since we learned that, we had to, we read it all our demos. Our demos now look like real websites. So that was a major learning curve for us. We used to consider that like the last five minutes of a project. Now it takes over a week. And, um, sorry, I forgot the first part of the question. Um, User-centered design appears to be a, a lengthy and expensive process. Yeah. Um, how do you see the return on investment working in your business? Uh, well, since starting Obox Teams, design has been one of the things that differentiates us from our competitors. Sort of the attention to detail that we put into, you know, fonts, spa uh, padding, white space, all that type of stuff. So for us, we we wouldn't know what it would be like without it. Uh, we're developing a product now which has gone through so many iterations on the interface um, without 
you know, placing so much emphasis on that interface design and the experience that's required for our customers. You know, we just have something that looks average. Um, a lot of like the world beating websites out there, the, the best websites out there are beautifully designed. Um, even though to us, you know, to a casual observer, they may seem average, but it's the little details that they place in those things. For example, if you go to Facebook and you log in and you're South African, the little world icon which has the notifications, that's actually focused on Africa. Whereas if, you log, if you're an American user, it's focused on America. And there's those subtle details which take forever to do, but are just subconsciously appreciated by your end user. Um, so as a designer, would you say your um, the value of your efforts is, is more qualitative than quantitative? Uh, yes. How, how many more sales? It's very really difficult to measure the design. You're right. Um, however, you know when you start refining a checkout flow, for example, and you, you you do need to get your designer involved in that, that's something that you can measure. But the nice touches around an interface, which a uh, product that people use, it's very difficult to quantify that. But there's definitely value. Absolutely. You know, if we made average looking themes, well, we have launched average looking themes, which we thought to ourselves, you know, let's just give this a try. We haven't put much time into it. And there's some things which I feel I'm not so happy with. Let's see how it sells. And it doesn't sell well. And when we, like, when we launch version two with the better design fundamentals implemented, um, sales are better, guaranteed. Great. Thank you very much. Gentlemen at the front there. Thank you very much. Uh, just got a quick thought though. So there's close to 8 billion people on the planet. Yeah. There's millions of tech companies out there employing these people. Like new and innovative ideas just, you know, they don't come around as often. So, I mean, you can th sit there and you can, if you've got the, the, the time and the money and the budget and so on and the staff to work on that whole process. But if you're a small guy and, you know, you're focusing on the MVP, is it okay, based on this whole talk you had about, you know, focusing on that user experience, to stick to conventions and the norms and the, what people are known to know works, to get that MVP out there, and then once you've got the budget and it's proven and, and you've got something, then to actually focus, reinvest time and money into actually getting a proper UX. Um, do you think it's, it's actually then worthwhile for the little guy just starting out to actually try and focus as much time on the UX? Uh, yes, absolutely. When we launched, you know, uh, not the redesigned before this current one, um, it was all based on conventions. Uh, and it did okay, you know, we, we made a lot of money, but when we did the user testing, when we had the budget to invest, we realized how many of those conventions went against what our users expected. Um, you know, the very, first person, the very first person that we tested, when they logged onto Obox, they clicked login, even though they weren't customers, they weren't, they'd never seen our site before, and the tester asked the end user, why are you logging in? She's like, no, I'm logging into my WordPress account because it says WordPress, you know, so. And then, sorry, one last follow-up question. If the money didn't come and the success wasn't there, would you still have gone through that lengthy process to try and see where you were going wrong and fixing it? Yes. Maybe we wouldn't have spent 100,000 Rand doing it, but, you know, we would have maybe negotiated a bit more. But, uh, Yes, um, even in hindsight, we always wanted to do it. Always, always, always. Uh, even though we were doing the designs ourselves, we, we felt that there must be something that we're missing. And it turns out that we were missing quite a bit. Great question. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have a Someone question for David? Sure. One moment. David, I appreciate how you're so passionate about design. So what my question is, um, you said design is an iterative process, especially in testing. So how often do you test after you've launched your theme or your new themes? Um, like how the, the time span? It does depend on the product. Uh, however, for example, the product that we're building at the moment, uh, we test it every two weeks. And that's uh, without investing any money. That's just my brother and I, uh, based on what we've learned from previous user experience tests, uh, we apply those conventions and test people all the time. Um, specifically, just holding an iPhone behind them and recording what they do and then watching it later over and over. And I mean, 
you can see on my Instagram account, uh, I've been posting some photos, Instagram forward slash David Peril, of this new interface, and the changes have been significant. Great, thank you. I think there was uh, another, another question here in the front. Yes. Um, you said that, like, with your, with your users testing, right? If your target audience ever overlaps, like say for the next project or something, or a few projects down the line, do you ever reuse that data? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so could that then start becoming new conventions? For your product, yes. Uh, you, you almost build up a database of feedback, and sometimes when you see a problem that you, you, know, you can't wrap your head around, I'll rewatch videos from the past and see, you know, it may be, not necessarily about that specific thing, but other elements in our design have resulted in a certain fix which could help with the problem that we're facing now. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, that Does being it said, become cheaper as you go along? Well, yeah, we, uh, look, we only spend the money once. After that, my brother and I did it ourselves for, it's been three or four years now. So, yeah, absolutely. You don't need to uh, pay professionals all the time to do it. Just pay attention when you're paying those professionals. Great, thank you. We've got time for one more question before Dave has to jet off to Italy. Maybe. Um, when you're changing your design, according to the feedback, do you follow the 80-20 rule? Like it's got to work well for 80%, some 20% are always going to be dwarfed and just not be able to do it? Or do you make it work for everybody? No, you've, you've got to be careful with uh, it's impossible to make it work for everyone. So the more, the more people you test, the more you can see a trend developing and then you address that trend. Um, but if you just test one person, you're unlikely to understand fully what's wrong. Sometimes that person is the anomaly. But a good rule of thumb is testing five people. Great. Thank you so much for all your questions, guys. Round of applause, please. <laughs>